the most rampant suspension right now is for linked accounts. And that is continuing from the last quarter of 2021. And I'm going to explain a little bit of why. Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and I am so glad that you're here. Now, if you are new to the Amazon Files podcast, then you might not have heard that Leslie Hensel of Riverbend Consulting is our, I would call her our resident Amazon policy and compliance um, consultant. She is a professional at Riverbend Consulting where they help people with suspensions, policy issues, and everything from account management for feedback, for uh, reimbursement, all those types of things. They're an amazing agency. I am a customer and client of theirs, and I absolutely love Leslie because of all of her amazing information. She is always keeping us updated on the latest news, the latest rules, the latest updates, all the pain points and headaches that we have dealing with Amazon, because let's be real. We have those on a daily basis, and Leslie and the team at Riverbend really helps us to understand what we need to be aware of in the here and now. So that's why she comes on every quarter because we really need to be updated and aware of what's going on with Amazon, what's new, what's changing, what is going to affect you and your business and your bottom line. And so Leslie, just to let you guys know, she has been an Amazon expert for a really long time. She's got two boys. She has leveraged two decades of small business consultations. And she really, she's been an Amazon seller for almost a decade. She knows what we're going through and she has personally helped hundreds of third-party sellers get their accounts and ASINs back, um, getting rid of suspensions, preventing your account from being suspended. That's part of what they do at Riverbend as well. So um, I wanted to welcome our guest, Leslie Hensel, back to the show. But before we do that, I wanted to personally invite you guys to the Facebook group. We do have a free Facebook community where we're very restrictive about who gets in and you need a code word. Here is your code word. It is Riverbend. Okay, so that's your code word for this particular month. Um, You go to mommyincome.com slash join us. You join the Facebook group. That's where you get to be in the know about everything that's coming on for Amazon. Also our email list. So when you join us, then you'll get all of our emails so that you know uh, what's going on, what's coming up upcoming episodes, um, different workshops, in-person events. I'm doing a lot of in-person events this year. So make sure you're watching your inbox and your social media for all those things. So if you want to join the free Facebook group, go to mommyincome.com forward slash join us, use the code word riverbend and come into our club. So we would love to have you there. If you've got, whether you're new or advanced and you want to learn more about Amazon or you have questions, it is a great community. We have several admins that are very qualified to answer your questions along with myself and lots and lots of really smart, super awesome sellers like yourself who just need a community to belong to. Now I know there's 512,000, all kinds of Facebook groups for Amazon sellers. And that's great. This is just one more. But if you are really particularly learning about wholesale, wholesale bundling, and you want to know more about those specific things, this is the group for you. So I want to be able to make sure that you're joining us. Also, don't forget if you're list- if you're watching on YouTube, hit that little bell in the corner there. That's your subscribe button. You subscribe so that you never miss a video from us. Some occasionally we drop YouTube shorts, we drop five minute videos and demos and things like that. You don't want to miss anything, right? So you want to make sure you go to that demo and you go to that little bell, uh, probably right up there in your corner and you hit subscribe so that you never miss what's going on here at mommy income and the Amazon files. And for listeners, you can always subscribe and make sure that you're subscribed in your favorite podcast, uh, app, whatever it is that you're using to listen to the Amazon files. We appreciate that. We appreciate reviews. All those things help us become more visible so other people can be helped by the Amazon files just like you. So let's get to Leslie. She is back another time and we're so glad we can have her. Leslie, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. So happy to be here as always. For sure. We are just going to jump right into getting to these 2022 updates. I know you're here almost every quarter and we kind of go towards the end of the quarter. So we've got lots of stuff to talk about. Um, So tell us first and foremost, what is the most important thing that we're going to need to know right now as far as the new seller policies and rules and all the stuff that's been going on since 2022 began? 
the most rampant suspension right now is for linked accounts. And that is continuing from the last quarter of 2021. And I'm going to explain a little bit of why. So Amazon um, made it very clear a little more than a year ago that it was okay to have more than one account. And they've always said this, but they made it like an announcement, you know, because I think there was a lot of confusion. You can have more than one seller account if there's a really good reason to. So if you have two private label brands, if you use one account that you're selling lawnmowers and the other one you're selling greeting cards, you're going to want to have different accounts. So if you have a good business re reason, you can have more than one account. So then after they gave everyone the blessing, then they proceeded to really crack down on people who had more than one account, but it wasn't for the good reason. So Amazon uses a lot of artificial intelligence. And AI, as you know, what makes it kind of creepy but effective is that it learns over time. And so they programmed it early on to match things like, oh, Kristen has two accounts that have the same bank account. And it looks like they're selling the same things. And you can't do that, right? Because you're not supposed to sell the same thing on two accounts. So they would catch you with things like same addresses, same bank accounts, things that were super obvious then the AI starts learning. And so it started to uncover more and more of these people who have um, old accounts that were suspended literally a decade ago or longer, uh, catching people who used to live with their cousin when they were at college and they haven't lived together for seven years, but they each have an Amazon business. So it would link them together, even though that's not fair or right. You can get those reinstated, but you're still having to prove a negative. It's very difficult. So as the AI has learned, it has learned correctly and it has also learned incorrectly. So we are seeing people legitimately suspended for linked accounts who had closed accounts many years ago because they got in trouble. And then they opened a new one recently. And then a lot of illegitimate linkages to things that just don't make sense. We can't even figure out why they were linked to anyone. or having to prove why it's really okay to have these multiple accounts. So if you have a relative, a friend, someone you live with, um, someone you share warehouse space with, someone you sell the exact same products as that you spend a lot of time with, be sure that you do not do anything proactively that makes it look like you're a bad guy. Make sure that you really do have an LLC for each account, that that LLC has its own address or its own PO box that it has its own bank account, most important thing, and that you're not mingling inventory across accounts because they're going to find it out. That's great advice. I know those are some things because I know last time that we talked, we talked about having, you know, you, we talked in, in detail about the fact that we could, you guys that are listening, if you hadn't catched that episode, go to the Amazon files, search Leslie's name and your river bend, and you will find the episodes relevant to that. So please go back and listen to those. They're all still relevant. Some things new have changed. But in the last episode, we talked about that. We talked about how it's perfectly acceptable, according to Amazon, to do this. But there is a process proper way to execute these things and making sure that your things don't cross. But, but this is now even happening to people that aren't bad players. They just happen right. to be connected. And so, um, you know, if you're having two accounts that are perfectly awesome and running smoothly and you're not breaking any of the rules, you could maybe still get flagged. And although they might reinstate it, it's going to cause you a lot of hassle in your business. And uh, one thing you did mention before was having a VPN, uh, right? To kind of protect your IP address, at least so that we're not crossing in those lines either. Is that still something you recommend? It can be very useful um, if you are legitimately running more than one account, if you use a VPN so they don't think you're on the same IP address and think for some reason you're doing something you're not supposed to. The biggest thing though is to stay away from selling in the same category. And of course you cannot sell the same ASINs. And the reason that the ASIN thing matters so much and it gets you busted fastest is that isn't an Amazon thing. That's a federal law thing. So if you have two companies selling the same ASIN on the same listing, you're competing with yourself and then you're pricing against yourself. And so arguments can be made that there's price fixing going on. Yeah, that's a great. I mean, anything that's, that's going to get anyone into legal trouble, we're not going to mess with, you know? 
especially, you know, it comes to trademarks, copyrights, IP infringement, these are becoming more and more and more of a problem, even from the brand level, not necessarily for the Amazon level. And what what, do you, what has changed within like the IP claims and, and the reporting process for that? Because I know you guys deal with a ton of that. And I know there's been some new stuff as far as we've had even with our private label stuff, have had some IP infringement complaints that are false, but they're still coming. And so we're like, oh, how do we handle this when this is our private label brand that we also include wholesale products with? And then we're getting IP claims, but they're not from the brand owners. They're from competitors once we dig. So, you know, tell us a little bit more about the new IP stuff and what's going on with that. Amazon's done a really bad job in its new brand registry. We were also hopeful that Amazon brand registry 2.0 is going to solve all of our problems. Um, And really just like everything else, they built it for Amazon. They didn't build it for sellers. Um, So the things that you thought you were going to be able to do, you can't do. So you can't really protect yourself and your content by being brand registered. You do need to be brand registered because you at least have a shot at protecting yourself, but it is by no means a panacea and the, the answer to all of your problems. So what happens is uh, people will file IP complaints. They will spoof that they're the brand owner. They will use generic email addresses. So they will use email servers offshore from countries that don't extradite. Uh, They will sometimes just flat out file a complaint and not even try and spoof anything. Amazon has very poor training among people who just do some of this enforcement. And here's the problem. The law requires Amazon to act on these complaints. They don't have a choice. They can't say, oh, I think that looks bogus and just ignore it. Because once someone files an IP complaint, they have to do something about it. So they will enforce even if these are garbage and even if they don't make any sense. So thing number one, you have to be brand registered because that is the only, okay, we solve IP complaints for people that aren't brand registered. But if you are, it's going to make your life much better. You're taken more seriously. Your complaints are listened to. Uh, you're con- you are more legitimate in Amazon's eyes because that's their system. That's number one. Number two is if you get one of these complaints and it's ridiculous, just like Kristen said, she figured out it was a competitor because you're going to start by looking at the email address. You're going to look for any clues in the message. You're going to look for patterns of what products, if you have multiple ASINs included, And try and figure out who that competitor is, because if you can point that out to Amazon, it's very helpful because they will see that for what it is, which is trying to control distribution or get rid of competition a lot of times. Uh, Even though you've used your trademark to register an Amazon brand registry, do not assume that means that Amazon has access to your trademark paperwork or even believes you have one. So you're always going to need that information handy, a screenshot or a PDF of your paperwork that you can send in if there is a trademark claim on you. Uh, The easiest of these to file is copyright. Uh, If someone files copyright, have your images handy. Know when you uploaded them the first time. Know what you can say to prove that these are your images in your copy and that you're the one being knocked off. So a lot of times with these, with the really weird complaints, if you're in Amazon brand registry, if you reply with just valid information showing you're the, you're the registered brand owner, here's your trademark and you know a copy of your invoice from your supplier, or whatever it might be, it'll make them go away pretty quickly, uh, about half the time. The other half the time, there is some more back and forth. It is frustrating though, Kristen, because there shouldn't even be these back doorways. It's absolutely unreal. We have recently, you know, we've created our own brand and our own bundle brand that we have. We are trademarked. We have all the paperwork, all these things. And we still have bad players jumping on our listings, thinking they can copy us when number one, they don't have our custom packaging. Um, mm-hmm. And number two, they don't have the, the, the components cannot possibly match because we custom make one of the pieces that's involved in most of these bundles. And, but I was, I was going to read this. I mean, not that you don't already know what this says, but I'm trying to find the language that I was reading. Basically you have to certify under perjury of law when you report somebody as a trademark violator. 
And so you're, you're certifying that this is almost a legal document saying that under the perjury of law, this person is violating my trademark. They're getting very specific to the point where they almost are requiring me to prove that this person is using my trademark, except for they're not actually using the trademark. They're just selling under my listing without my packaging. Mm -hmm. So are they violating my trademark by selling under my listing without my packaging? So you could actually make an argument that that's a counterfeit product. And that is what I would do is file that as a counterfeit product because it does not match the product. Mm -hmm. So it is indeed counterfeit because they're claiming it is this specific thing and it is not. Okay. Um, as to the, so you know how I said that Amazon is required to act on these things. It is because of exactly what you just said. It is because someone has filed this declaration saying, I am subject to perjury. Uh, I'm saying under penalty of law that this person is violating my trademark or that this product is counterfeit or whatever the case might be. Um, that's why they are forced to act on it. And apparently there's a lot of people out there with no scruples and no concern that anyone will ever come after them. One positive thing, mostly positive thing, is that Amazon has started to suspend brand registry for people making false claims. And unfortunately, there's a lot of bad enforcement where people who don't deserve to have their brand registry suspended, it's happening, and we've had to appeal that for them. But I think it's a good thing that people who are abusing their brand registry and are reporting people for things that are not true, they are losing their brand registry. It's fantastic. And it's one of the only good things to help counter this bad behavior that's going on. Yeah, that's good news to know, because I know that I am a person of integrity and honesty. And so I was getting ready to report a violator the other day, and I just hesitated for a moment and had to step back and, and ask myself, can I, under perjury of law, file this claim? Are they actually violating? And I wasn't sure, so I didn't. Because I thought, well, now that you explained that it was more counterfeit rather than a trait, because I thought, they're not actually, they're not using my trademark at all, which is part of the problem. The problem is, is that my product has this wonderful custom box that it comes in and it is fully trademarked and it is, you know, all these things. And this person is not using my custom packaging. Although the components inside might be the same, the packaging is not the same, which then is a misrepresentation of my brand. If someone mm -hmm. says, we bought this from you, but it's not yours, then I'm, I don't know, liable or I'm responsible or, you know, it doesn't have my name on it. So that's another thing that I was thinking of. And a lot of people are, are experiencing this because they've had brand registry for a while and the bad players are realizing, you know, we might be able to get away with, you know, selling on this listing or distributing these same products in this way. And it's got great reviews. So why wouldn't we, you know? Um, so that's an interesting thing um, to, to think about as far as that. So guys, when you're listening here, be honest, be upfront. If someone's violating your trademark, great. But if they're not, and they're just, uh, they just jumped on your listing because you have a great listing, guess what? That's not violating your trademark. Even if you have brand registry, it's, I'm not violating Nike, Nike's brand. If I sell legitimate Nike shoes under their listing, right? That's just me reselling a product. But if I put their Nike shoes into a different box and then said they were Nike, or I put Adidas shoes in there and said they were Nike, that's a trademark violation. Um, this is just more of somebody, you know, like you said, a counterfeit, right? So a counterfeit right. product is not identical. It doesn't have the packaging. It doesn't have the right brand marks on it. It's not, it's not, it's a fake. It really is a fake if it doesn't have your brand. So that would be a different report, but being honest and being upfront about that and guys making sure you're doing bundles the way I teach you to do bundles, which is according to Amazon's policies, because they can suspend you if you don't. And then that's a headache. And then you have to call Leslie and get yourself out of all kinds of trouble, which we're glad you're here, but we hope we never have to do that. Right. Well, and Kristen, because you are one of the good guys and you want to do things the right way. Um, when you see someone selling on your listing like that, if you want to be extra careful, which I understand, then you have to do the test buy. So you do the test buy of the product. You don't return it. You have to keep it. You got to suck it up. You don't, <laughs> you don't report them like through, uh, like to Amazon, like as a buyer, you don't complain. You don't do that. All you do is file the counterfeit report. And then you can use photos of that or an order ID of the test buy as support. 
yeah. to help get them thrown off your listing. Yeah. And absolutely. That's something that we can do. And you guys, you know, doing it right and making sure you have, I don't know, your own custom packaging with your brand on it. Like nobody else has this. This is my company. This is my brand. So if, if I'm sending bundles in my custom packaging and someone else is not, they're selling a counterfeit product. <laughs> and so, you know, things like that. This is why I teach all of you to do things the right way. Get brand registry, get trademarks, get your own custom packaging. It doesn't have to be expensive. It's just doing business legitimately. And then that protects you. So what other things do we need to be aware of and concerned about in as far as what's going on right now? So one interesting and cool thing that Amazon is doing in seller performance I'm always excited when there's something that actually makes it better for sellers because it doesn't <laughs> it's about very time. Often. <laughs> know, right? So for a limited set of ASIN reinstatements, some people are actually able to appeal by doing a training. We've seen this pop up on some you sold as new or condition complaints, and we've seen it pop up on expiration. So it, it it's not for everything time. It usually is like a one-time thing. It's kind of like they're giving you a second chance. Go through this training, learn about how to make sure your stuff doesn't expire at Amazon. Next time we're going to take it down, you're going to have to write an appeal. So for some people, if you go in and you click on that appeal button, when one of your ASINs is taken down, you might find out that there's a training course you can take. If you can do that, do it because it's fast, it's easy, you might even learn something. I mean, most of these training courses are common sense, but usually I can find like one or two little nuggets of information that are worth doing. You know, back when we all had to do that horrible pesticide class, I know <laughs> a lot of, I had to do it. I yes. mean, so many people had to do the pesticide thing. I learned a few things about pesticides that I did not know. That one was super technical. So I think everyone learned something on that For one. Sure, I did. But like, if, if you aren't accustomed to uh, like first in, first out and the way inventory management is done and why your stuff might expire, all these things, if you haven't spent time with that before really thinking about it, um, even if you don't really learn from the course, you are going to maybe rearrange some of your thinking and think differently about that inventory before you send it in the next time. So I'm kind of excited about this because um, I like it when instead of beating people up, they provide some education and, and they're helpful. Now, if I know Amazon, and unfortunately I do, um, I would bet you that in three to six months, this will disappear and they'll just go back to the old way because that's what happens. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it seems like they, they shoot first, ask questions later. They, they, you know, do all this. I was just thinking to that. I thought that would be awesome if they could use similar trainings for their customer service people. <laughs> Maybe they oh, can understand a little bit about how Amazon works. When it comes well, and you know, what's really funny is that every, like every six months, every year, we see some new initiative in seller performance. And some of them were like, wow. So like there was this one time where they changed everything to what we called appeal button appeals, where you could appeal almost anything just by clicking these radio buttons and writing a few sentences. And so for us, we were like, well, that's interesting because you know our business model is helping people appeal. A lot of our business will go away. And I was like, no, no, don't worry. Wait a few weeks. Two weeks later, it all disappeared because they figured out like it's just gaming. They're helping people game the game the system. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to figure out why your product got suspended. You just go click, 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 and then it's back, and that doesn't work. So they'll do these initiatives for a while. This one is actually helpful and useful, and then they'll decide it didn't work. It'll go right back to how it was. So, uh, but for now, it's a great development. <laughs> I think, you know, I think that's brilliant because, you know, did you know that they do this in the, um, well, at least in Michigan at the DMV, when you get a ticket, especially if you're under the age of 25 and you get a ticket for something specific, you can waive the fee if you take this certification class. So it's almost like my son had to do this um, not too long ago. He got this ticket. He was like, hey, they sent me this thing and said, I don't have to pay the fee if I just take this, you know, three hour, you know, online course to kind of teach me, 
some different safety things to not, you know, violate it. I don't know. It wasn't, it was speeding enough to be reckless driving. And so they go through this reckless driving course or whatever. I mean, young boys like to go fast in cars and they have to pay fines for that. Um, and so I think that was part of the process was, okay, learn the rules again and do all that. And actually it was really helpful. And I don't know that he's had a ticket since. So he didn't want to pay the fee, but you have to go through the course and answer the questions properly in order to waive that fee. So I thought that was a brilliant idea. And I think it's great even for Amazon because people respect their Amazon account enough to watch the training, maybe answer some relative relevant questions. And then now at least you're educated. So next time you can't say, I didn't know any better because right. they have a record that you took the training. See that they actually did something brilliant there. Who knew? <laughs> They did. They did. So I'm sure, I mean, because the better it is, the faster it'll go away. So I'm sure it will be gone. <laughs> it'll be gone soon. Hopefully that they'll keep it. I think especially for expiration, it really does make sense because like you sold this new, that's on you a lot of times. I know, and get, don't get me wrong, y'all. I'm, I've been a seller for a long time. I'm fully aware that a lot of you sold as new is because of garbage returns handling at Amazon. So they're reselling stuff that's open or it's because of customers who are trying to get free returns. So don't get me wrong, not bashing sellers, but the sellers that I know who have repetitive problems with this, that it's on them. No class is going to fix that. It is because they are not taking the time. They're not fixing the packaging. They don't want to go the extra mile. They don't want to solve whatever it is. And sometimes they have to have someone like in their face saying, I've read all of your complaints and I can tell you why this is, why aren't you shrink wrapping or whatever it yeah. is. Right. But on expiration, it's different. You really have to understand how the Amazon warehouse works, why they fail so much at their job mm -hmm. and what your responsibility is because people think because you're required to put an expiration date in when you send product to the warehouse, you have to put that in there. And because you're supposed to sticker it with the best buy date, which nobody does, um, they think that because you're supposed to do those things, Amazon's just gonna take care of the rest of it. And they'll never sell anything that's expired. Mm -hmm. No, so sorry, it's on you, it's on you. My worst expiration story, I mean, I haven't sold um, grocery or expiration date items in a very long time for that reason, because we even learned early on that they don't practice first in and first out unless you run out of inventory, which then ruins your listing and ruins your internet indexing. If you run out, they don't do first in, first out. They literally will just pack it back there. And um, we hadn't sold anything in a long time. We had some warehouse damage or lost or whatever inventory. They reimbursed us. Two years later, they put a box of granola bars back on the shelf that were very discontinued a long time ago. Someone bought them for an astronomical price. And then we're like, these expired two years ago. First of all, we had no idea that we even had those because we hadn't sold them in two years. They found it somehow, put it back in our inventory, and then sold it to somebody to <laughs> probably like boulders they're probably yeah, hard they're like, they're like concrete you know granola bars but the, the reality <laughs> is, is like this these things happen they lose things there's lost inventory it's misplaced you get reimbursed and then they find it somewhere and go oh this belongs to leslie we're putting it back on her shelf and they don't even check the expiration dates. Nobody's out there checking that. And so you cannot assume that they will do any work for you ever. They won't. As a matter of fact, so they might do bad work for you. <laughs> so you want to hear my, my magical strategy, my, my best ever strategy for if you sell anything that expires ever. Um, so anyone who sells, especially I've got a lot of people who replenish things, uh, grocery or, mm -hmm. um, you know, beauty products, supplements, all of these, they all expire and you have the exact, see, that's the nightmare is what Kristen just said is the nightmare where they, they're literally finding three-year-old inventory and reselling it. And I've heard that from so many people. So don't, don't think that what she's saying is unusual. It's not. Um, but if you have replenishables that you sell in grocery, for example, and let's say you send new stock into the warehouse every month, um, start putting those on different SKUs. So it's the same ASIN, but on different SKUs instead of just replenishing under the same SKU. And so that way uh, you leave that SKU closed. As soon as it gets to the warehouse, the new one, you close it and your, your inventory is sitting there until your existing SKU sells out. Then you turn on the new SKU and then you close the old SKU so that if there are returns in 30 or 60 or 90 or 120 or two years, 
If there's a return of one of these or it's found in the warehouse, it they trash it. They put it in your unfulfillable and you just don't sell it. So you can only have one SKU open at a time, FBA, and one merchant fulfilled. And you might decide that there are a few quick returns that you want to sell, you know, if it's beauty or something like that. Uh, and you just turn that SKU back on. But if you will kill off the old SKUs, you're going to make sure that they are not going to be selling a two-year-old bottle of aspirin that they found that rolled under a shelf somewhere. That's brilliant. And yeah, it seems like a little bit more work, but if you're selling replenishables and something like that, it's worth the work. I mean, what's your alternative? Your alternative is to get suspended or have an ASIN suspended. And if you're making thousands of dollars a month on an ASIN that gets suspended, you're screwed for that amount of time until you can either fight with them to get back, which we know takes weeks, if not months for them to even, you know, give you an answer. Um, and the other, the other issues, um, with the expiration dates and things like that is that, um, they, they have to be a certain size. They're not reading them. They're not putting, putting the right codes on the right thing. Sometimes people have said, well, I, I stickered mine and then they took the sticker off. Well, a customer could have, and could have returned that. I mean, I don't know. I personally stay away from things that expire because I don't want to deal with that headache. I did that before and it just wasn't worth the, the energy. And there's plenty, there's millions of products to sell. So you don't have to sell things that expire, but if you do change your SKUs and change them often and make sure that you have a really good system and process in place to try track those things, because that also sounds like a bookkeeping nightmare in my opinion, <laughs> but, um, you know, still that's, just really good advice as far as, so closing the ASINs so that it's closing the SKUs, changing the SKU, it could be as simple as one digit. You could have the same SKU except for one digits different at the end. Maybe it's one, two, three, four, 10, whatever it is. And you can continue selling the same SKU. And at that point, you know, if, especially if it's a wholesale item, it's not something that's private label or whatever else, then you've got, you know, you don't really have to worry too much about that. So that's great. Yeah, um, I always put the date as part of my SKU. So I knew which lot, you know, which almost like a lot number. Yeah. So I would put in that it's February, 2022. And then the next one is March, 2022. So I know which one it is. And you don't just have to do this for stuff that's expired. You can do it for anything where you have suspicions that there are problems with Amazon returns handling with your items. So I had a client who did this because they sold high end hair appliances. So they sold like $150 straighteners and Amazon was doing bad return handling and they were reselling straighteners that had hair in them, which is disgusting. And so, but what my client didn't want to do is clean all the inventory out and bring it all back and look at all of it um, because then they would have this period of time where they would have nothing selling. So they sent in a new batch of the straightener on a new SKU. And when it was live, then they did a removal order for the last 15, 20, however many were at the warehouse that they suspected were being sold over and over again with hair in them. And then they returned greater than themselves. And the ones that had been opened, they sent them in on the next batch, right? Mm -hmm. So that way you can clean out. If you've got some kind of problem where they're reselling bad inventory, you can clean it out without ever going out of stock. You just wait till that new SKU is ready to go, sitting in the warehouse, turn it on, turn off the other one, do the removal. So another thing that we've come up with, because we had bad inventory being sold on something that was equally disgusting, if not worse, on our private label product. And we could not, first of all, we had a terrible review that still has not been able to be removed. They, they ignored me everywhere from the Bezos email down to here, bad review from customer, completely Amazon's fault. They won't own it. They won't take care of it. They just, they, they keep ignoring us. They keep saying they, they, we're in the loop of, you know, we're reporting this over and over and over. Right. So um, we have now everything that goes in from now on has a seal sticker on it. In other words, if this seal is broken, immediately return it, let Amazon know that sort of thing, because we want our customers to know that this should be, this seal should not be broken. If this seal is broken, you have received a de defective item and please return it immediately. So that has cut down on the returns coming back. And we've also protected that ASIN with a do not redistribute, do not, like this is an exception. It doesn't go into like liquidation or whatever else. So we get to they're, they can't sell those returns there. There was some way that I was able to, to be able to get to that done, but still that's the same type of problem that they're not looking, they don't examine your right. items. 
especially bundlers, especially bundlers, pay attention to these things because the warehouse worker that's receiving the return and putting it back on yourself is not looking at your components. They're not counting pieces in there, deciding if it's sellable or not. They're literally just putting it back. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I, I was just going to say, I'm a big fan of the, the sticker. That's very smart. We tell people to say, if a uh, seal is broken, item is not new. Um, because that's like a big woo to the warehouse staff. And right. <laughs> we're not actually saying that to the customer. We're yeah. saying that to the return staff at Amazon. I know, if right? Seal is broken. Item is not new. And so, but yeah, because we don't want to say any words that make it sound like you did anything wrong. You did a great job on yours too. Right. Because you don't want to use words that make it sound like you're the bad guy or you're giving them something used. You have to really think through that wording because people read it all wrong, right? Yeah. It has to be just, it's not new. So yeah, don't mess sure. with it. Pack. Don't touch. Don't touch. Right. <laughs> And, and the thing is, we can't lead them to our customer service line, which we could immediately say, don't, you know, re return this back to us, not to Amazon or however it is. And we'll send you a replacement from our website. Like those ones we know for sure have not been tampered with. Um, but right. because that's against policy as well, we can't leave that in there. Um, and so, yeah, we've had some issues with returns being sold and it was a complete logistical and financial nightmare because, you know, bad reviews ruin your listings, right? Yep. So it's just like, oh, goodness gracious. But um, so anybody who's selling products like that, either super high end expensive or something that could potentially have that gross factor of like, I mean, you don't want to get toothbrush heads that are like, this seal is broken. Could you imagine? Ugh. So um, because of that, you know, making sure if, if seal is broken, item is not new, that's great wording. You can print those probably on your own Dymo if you wanted to and just putting it over the package or get a little fancier with sticker mule or something like that. But um, that's a way that you can protect yourself from the warehouse workers that literally don't give one iota about your product. They're probably just tossing it into a pile and scanning a barcode and moving about their lives. So. I love it that you said gross factor. I know I've used that phrase before because mm -hmm. it, people don't realize y'all it, it gets bad. I know everyone saw that waffle maker thing that went viral a couple of years ago where someone got a waffle maker from Amazon that had like waffle batter in it, but it had molded. And I had a client who sold coffee makers that had moldy coffee in them. Um, I mean, there are some disgusting things that happen. Also products that don't have safety seals like mouthwash uh, that doesn't have the safety seal, all kinds of things, bad things happen in the Amazon warehouse. And it's exactly <laughs> what Kristen said. Um, a lot of the warehouse workers don't care. The ones that do care still have ridiculous quotas put on them of how quickly they're supposed to process. And they're not comparing it to like you're expected to compare your product to your Amazon detail page and make sure that everything's there. They don't have that. They're just eyeballing it and guessing uh, because they do not have time to make sure all the pieces and parts are there. And so you would like to think that then they would err on the side of throwing it in the unfulfillable pile, um, but they don't. And you know, this is an interesting thing. When you're a small news seller, you're like really sad when they put things in the unfulfillable pile. And then when you get to be more substantial and you see this as a real business, you're like, freaking put it all in an unfulfillable, man, don't put any of it. Yes. <laughs> I'll pay them pull it back home and look at it, please. It's worth it the dollar or whatever it is to send it back to me for me to just look <laughs> at it. We have, okay. So we have, we use a prep center, right? So our prep center um, sends all of our inventory out, but at, at our return center, which is our home address, <laughs> our return center is our, where we have all unfulfillable stuff come back. So I personally, it, you know, unbox all these things and decide whatever. So once a month, we take the tub of unfulfillables that are actually sellable to the prep center, because that's only 20 minutes from my house. And we give them back, we just like re-sticker these or rebag these, these are all complete. But like nine out of 10 of them come back with missing items that then turn into claims because the customer has sent something back that was literally used. Like I'm talking about like, plastic red solo cups that were a 20 pack that then somebody used 10 of them and sent 10 of them back in its wrapper. And like, this was not as described <laughs> because you use them, you oh, just some things. Um, and so, yeah, that requires a case to be open and say, Amazon, somebody returned this product half used and without all of the pieces and I want reimbursement. And that takes time and energy and craziness, but it's your money. You got to chase it down. Amazon's not going to hand it back to you just for fun. 
<laughs> the struggle is real. Oh, to have so much time in life that you can actually use half of the solo cups and you have time to return the other half. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> oh, I know. But I'm in my cabinet moving on. I don't yes. know I'm like, really, really so many questions. <laughs> I know. Why? Why did you have the end? Well, first of all, where is your morality scale that you would use half of a product and then send it back as uh, not as described. And then, you know, it's like, do you not think someone's not going to look at this? Well, they, most of the time they don't. They don't. Most sellers will not take the time to follow up on this process, but it's part of my week. I follow up on these. I get the little slips from Amazon that in the box with the returns. And I actually got somebody else's $500 concrete testing electrical piece of equipment as one of my returns. And the return was supposed to be, uh, I believe napkins, like literally cloth napkin bundle that I had. It was supposed to be cloth napkins. It turned out to be this piece of equipment and my husband recognized it. And he was like, what is this? Where did this come from? I said, it was an Amazon return. It was supposed to be napkins. And it's this, he goes, this thing's like five or $600. Sure enough, we looked it up on Amazon five or six. It was like $559. And some seller is out that inventory. And if I call Amazon, they'll be like, send it back to us. That person's never getting that back. I have been better off sending it to the personal address than sending it back to Amazon. Cause they're not going to put it in the right place. So, oh, yeah. And I was going to say, have you ever tried to fix one of those? You can't. You cannot fix one of those. You cannot make it right. They actually act like you did something wrong. I've tried to make those right before. And Amazon has acted like I was a terrible person. I was supposed to get back something really cheap. I don't remember what it was. And we got back like 12 pairs of these really nice, expensive men's socks. And I mean, expensive, like $25 a pair of socks. Because mm -hmm. at least in my house, that's expensive. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For we socks. tried to... We buy the big bag of socks, right? right. Costco <laughs> versions. <right? Yeah. laughs> these were really nice socks. And I was like, okay, I need to get these back to whoever these were supposed to go to. Cause this is, you know, 200 bucks or 300 bucks or whatever worth of socks. Uh, no, it wasn't going to happen. I mean, they, yeah. they, they were like, well, how did you get these? I, that was literally one of the responses. I'm like, I placed Ooh. a removal over on, over on my own account for like a body mist or something. Yeah. Like, and got a whole <laughs> bunch of these it, the quantities none of it made sense so yeah, yeah that's how much they care about your inventory uh, uh, they're in the warehouse and that's why the returns creating is so well and that's the thing is if you're going to sell something super expensive like 500 pieces of equipment um merchant fulfill is an option for you. I know yeah. most people, I, I love FBA. Of course it really, you get the lion's share of the sales with that and everything else, but I love that for everything under $50. If it's right. more than that and you can't afford it, just, just fulfill it because eventually if it's in that demand, people will buy it and take the extra few minutes to, uh, or a few days to get it merchant fulfilled because, uh, otherwise you're letting them handle $500 pieces of equipment that then turn up missing and they don't know what happened to it and they might not reimburse you. And then you have to deal with invoice. Ugh, the struggle is always real with Amazon, but you know, the thing about it is the, your business is your business and your business needs to be managed by you or one of your team members, because this is part of doing e-commerce business. There's logistics, there's inventory management, there's returns, there's damaged products. And all of these things can have a place in time. If you have the personnel or doing it yourself to be able to uh, reconcile these things, because when you're trusting someone else with your inventory and your money, there's going to need to be accountability some way or another, whether it's on your end or their end. And we all know it ain't on their end. So we might as well take care of it on our end. <laughs> Amen to that. You've got to watch them like a hawk. Okay. Last quick question. Um, have you ever, have you seen anybody getting in trouble at all for, for unscrupulous PPC issues? Oh my goodness. It's so funny because we have, uh, we, we run our business on Slack, like a lot of folks out there. And we have a channel for uh, customer queries that are challenging that we talk about before we accept a customer sometime. And I just was answering one of those right before we started recording. Yes, that is a thing. Um, Amazon has a lot of things they do not like you to do in PPC. And unfortunately, Amazon has actually done a bad job uh, monitoring 
some of this. I don't think they've really had the capability in place to monitor and in a similar area as well. So in PPC, can you use someone else's brand names? Yes, but there's words that you cannot use. You have to be really careful. Um, at, so the, the PPC example that's the easiest, so people know what we're talking about, is you're selling a product that is a supplement, a supplement, and you want Amazon to think that there's nothing in that product that's a restricted ingredient. And so you don't have any restricted ingredient words in the listing, but then in your PPC ads in the back end of them, you will use words like CBD, weed, and then other street slang. And so everyone who is looking for said products will know that what you're selling is not the supplement. It's actually something else. Um, people also violate PPC rules to attack competitors in very odd ways. It's super technical how they do it. Uh, but Amazon is suspending some ad accounts right now. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that some people have asked me some rules about PPC and can you use your competitors brand names and can you use this and that? Well, my answer is always read Amazon's policy thoroughly. I am, I mean, I, I'm, I guess I could be a policy expert in a sense that I probably read a lot of these many, many times. And of course, you guys are even more of the experts there because that's what you deal with clients and things. But when it comes to that, I'm just like, if you're getting a gut check that maybe you shouldn't, the chances of you maybe shouldn't are probably accurate. If you're thinking, well, like you said, like if it's a marijuana product and you're trying to get around the fact that you can't call it that, I mean, like tobacco smoking pipe, we all know what those are. We all know what those are, but yet people are trying to pass them off as just a tobacco smoking pipe. And if they're not, right. you know, their back end says something because when you, if you type in marijuana, into Amazon search bar as a buyer, you're tons of products are going to come up and you kind of wonder, hmm, what is that in there? And it's not a restricted product. Uh, it's, not, it's a restricted product, yet it's showing up. Like it's because people are using those terms in the back end to rank, except for they're not actually selling those products. So people are asking, well, is that allowed? Is that legal? Is that in the terms of service? And no. It's not allowed. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right now. That's a huge deal with herb grinders. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Herb grinders. Uh, Amazon took down hundreds of herb grinders in the last couple of months, and they have gone from trying to get rid of them to being like hardcore getting them all off Amazon. And so, a lot of the people who sell those. They only had the keywords in the back end of the listing and then Amazon found all those. So then they tried relisting them and putting all of the keywords in their PPC and that's getting busted. Now, as far as using your competitor's name, it's very interesting. You cannot do that in your listing and in your keywords in your listing, you can do it in your PPC. Um, I, I think it's because Amazon wants to bid up those terms. Also your PPC on Amazon, you're not, uh, infringing on anyone's copyright, uh, whereas if it's in your listing, you are infringing on someone's copyright and using their copyrighted term to sell your product. And it's not really that way in the PPC because your ad isn't popping up their stuff. It's just popping up from that keyword. Um, so you're good on that. Uh, but it, the other interesting thing to know is on A plus content. Amazon did not in the past search a plus content, it was images. So you would submit your A plus content, which now is called enhanced brand content, and they would approve that. They approve it before it goes live on your site, on your listing. Part of your content though, is that when you upload it, when it's approved, you can put in the meta tag. So when someone hovers over it, language pops up. So we've recently been seeing a spate of clients who, golly gee, why am I busted for restricted products? And we couldn't find anything wrong in the listing. And then we hovered over their enhanced brain content. There it was. It was in the meta tags that it was popping up that language when you hovered. It only works on certain browsers and they were slipping the restricted keywords in there. And so we'd go back to the client and say, so you didn't mention to us. <laughs> <laughs> If everyone was just <laughs> honest with you up front, it would probably save you and your team a whole lot of headaches, would it not? 
I guess they thought, you know, they, hey, they got it past Amazon for a long time. And, and I don't know how good Amazon's tech is at catching that yet. Um, I'm not even sure if that's why Amazon caught that listing, but I just thought it was worth mentioning because it's kind of a new a strategy people are using. But just know we're starting to see um, suspensions of restricted products and of copyright for slipping those competitor brand names and slipping those restricted product names into uh, that, you know, back in enhanced brand content. Yeah. The thing is, is that like, we're going to kind of close out a little bit with this and this something that we're always talking about, right? Is it like it? Yes, yes, yes. There are things that happen in Amazon where they unfairly picked on you by accident because their AI caught something that you really didn't do. There are mistakes that they make and they link accounts and things like that. But most of the time, they're not just picking on random people. You did something wrong, knowingly or unknowingly, and they're not just randomly scooping up a bunch of people. And there's not some mean dude that's having a bad day going, let's pick on Leslie today and let's see if her account's doing anything wrong. No, it's automated. It's all AI. It's all artificial intelligence. It's all bots. It's all picking up on words and text and images and things like that to where if you can use Google Lens or Google Image Search and find things. You think Amazon's not a thousand times smarter than that? Like they are. And so because of that, let's just be honest, whether you knew it or not, if you're getting flagged by Amazon nine of 10 times, you did something wrong, whether unknowing or unknowing or knowingly and trying to hide that from anybody that's trying to help you is ridiculous. That's like lying to your own lawyer. (laughs) It's like, don't, you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you. Don't lie to your own liar, lawyer. And if you're contacting Leslie and the people at Riverbend to help you with suspension issues, just tell them everything so they can help you because they're on your side, not Amazon's side most of the time. Um, if you're a bad player, they might say, this is your problem. Good luck with that. <laughs> most of the time you have did something or unknowingly or knowingly and it, we need to deal with it. So being honest and upfront about that helps hopefully helps process move along a little faster because nobody wants to be suspended whether they did something or not um and if so the more information that you can be upfront about the easier it is to fix the problem am i right (laughs) oh and we have people who did do the wrong thing all the time and we help them you know get right we have our little come to jesus meeting and explain why it happened and say, this is how we fix it, and we help them fix it. And some of them knew they were doing the wrong thing, and some of them didn't. And, you know, as long as you're not out there hurting other sellers, I don't really care what you did before. I want to help you get where you're not doing it now. People who are intentionally hurting other sellers, that's a different thing. We don't do the black hat thing. But the but the people who, you know, they were just trying to get an advantage, and so they were you know, using their competitor keywords or their competitor's brain and their keywords or something. And I get it. I, I, I could see doing that from ignorance. Um, whatever. Let's just fix it and move forward. But yeah, you, you got to be honest with yourself and your team. Sometimes it's your team has done something and you have to convince them. I'm not out to get you. This is not about punishing anybody. I just need the information and let's set some policies and do the right thing going forward. And then if you're working with me or someone else, tell us the stuff because it goes much faster. (laughs) Absolutely. Honest to goodness. That's just the reality of, of this all you guys. It's just like, do business with integrity. Stop trying to circumvent the rules. Stop trying to get around them. Some of them. Yes. Just admit to yourself and have that own come to Jesus moment where you're like, yep. Amazon is not always, they're not they're great at their policies. They're not great at customer service. They're not great at all this, but they are the largest distribution third party marketplace seller in the universe. And if you want to make money with them, it's just best to follow the rules as best that you can. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I can sell over seven figures anywhere else right now, except maybe Walmart, which I'm working on. (laughs) But besides that, this is the biggest and best place to sell products. So if you sell product, if you have a brand, if you have all this stuff, you're in the right place, but don't waste your breath bitching about all the crazy rules that they have, because I know as well as anybody knows that yes, they're crazy. They, They shoot first, ask questions later. They start a program and end a program. They do this, they do that. However, at the end of the day, (laughs) you are playing on their playground and it's best to play by their rules because they will very swiftly boot you out if you don't do it right. So just 
do it right. <laughs> <laughs> the end. That's my soapbox. <laughs> All right, Leslie. So tell everybody where they can find you and your wonderful services and all of the wonderful services that you provide because everybody needs to know it's not just about suspensions. You guys do so much more at Riverbend. Yes. So Riverbend does lots of stuff and more stuff all the time. So in addition to just the regular old reinstatements, uh, we help with when you have problems. If you've got inventory stuck in trans shipping for three months and no one will tell you why. Uh, if you've got inventory that the CubaScan measured it wrong and they will not correct the measurements and they're charging you too much, things like that. We can help you solve those problems. We have reimbursement services for the lost and damaged inventory that Amazon does not reimburse you for, which is most of it. Uh, most of it is not automatic. You have to use a service like mine or do it yourself. It's very hard. Um, in addition, we have the best product videos on Amazon that we create with a partner. We just started a listing optimization service, literally sending out the first marketing messages right now for that. Fantastic work that we're doing there. Very exciting. We can get you editorial recommendations. I mean, we're just doing all this stuff. And then if you're like Kristen and you have some ASINs that are real winners on Amazon and you want to get into retail, we can help you do that too. So you can... <laughs> That's my next step. Just so you know, my next step for Riverbend to help me is get my awesome private label product into big major chain retail stores. So that's my next step with you guys is figuring out what that looks like. And you guys, their videos, if you have a product that needs either an animation video or even just a regular video and you're not a video person, they do fantastic. I've seen the portfolios. I've seen what they can create for your enhanced brand content and just for your listing videos. So if if that's something you're in the marketplace for and that's re you're ready to kind of push go on that, um, they offer much more than just fixing your Amazon problems and your suspensions, but they also can help you just make more money with the products that you're already working so hard to sell. So um, please check out Riverbend, uh, riverbendconsulting.com, right? Yes. And there's a phone number there and we actually answer the phones, which I know in this day and age is a crazy thing to say, but we have people there who are happy to discuss the problem or discuss what you need without like just trying to get your credit card because some problems we can help with and some we need to send you somewhere else. So we're happy to talk to you. And then if you go on over to LinkedIn and you put in my name, I have fresh brand new Amazon content every week. So please connect or follow or do the things there. Yes, absolutely. Especially those LinkedIn articles and even the little small posts that Leslie putting on there. That's like on the, my top feed. I'm always looking at all that because it keeps me informed of knowing some things and then I can pass it on to you guys. And, you know, Leslie can't be here every day. So I pass on your little tidbits every now and then in, in weekly episodes. I'd be like, well, I read this from Riverbend. So it has to be good, accurate and right because anything you hear from them is going to be. Um, and so making sure you guys, I don't give lots of recommendations for a lot of products and services. Um, that I have not tried. As a matter of fact, I was looking for the numbers just now while you were talking about that. Um, we just did our final year in taxes or whatever. And I wanted to give you the number that Riverbend has gotten back from us from for, for our company for uh, reimbursements, damages, reconcile, you know, irreconcilable issues that we have on Amazon. And it was like over $3,000 last year. So oh, if you have lots of money that you want to record, re get back from Amazon and it's not upfront, they give you a percentage of what they get back for you. So you don't even have to like pay a monthly fee. It's here's what we got back for you. Here's what we charged you for our percentage. The end. I'm like, ah, it's the greatest. And when they need invoices from you, you just get an email that says, Hey, we need an invoice for this. And you email it and your life is so much easier. So that's just one of the services that they have there. And you got to plug your conference that's coming up. I mean, it's, it's in the fall, but you still have to talk about that as well, because I feel like so many people are going to benefit from coming to this surge conference. So tell us about that too. You're so sweet, Kristen. And thank you for saying such nice things. I just love it. So the conference we have is called the Surge Summit. It is our first year. It's going to be in Tampa Bay, Florida, and it is going to be September 6th through 8th. So there's a big welcome party on the 6th and the content is on the 7th and the 8th. And what we are shooting for is to have the best content of any Amazon conference because we've all been to conferences where people sell from the stage. I don't like that. 
I, that's not my style. It makes me uncomfortable, <laughs> y'all. I want to hear from people who are real sellers. Our keynote speaker is the CFO of one of the biggest sellers on Amazon, uh, PharmaPax, which is now packable. And he used to be the CFO of Walmart Online. I mean, we have serious content, serious people, but also for all levels of seller and all kinds of different things, talking about PPC, talking about going to retail, you name the topic. It is not all Riverbend people. Riverbend is presenting sponsor. We do have some of our ex-Amazonians who are going to be speaking, um, but then we have some great experts from all over the industry. But the most important thing is we've got power sellers. We've got sellers who can really speak on your level and give you great information. And then we decided we wanted to build in the fun uh, and make it all for one price. So as part of the conference, we're having a cruise of Tampa Bay that's like a sunset dinner cruise, which is going to be so much fun. And we're going to have an arcade that's on all the time. So when you get sick of content, you want to run out with your buddies. It's going to be like a throwback 80s arcade with like Pac-Man and people and pool and, and super <laughs> mario bros and donkey kong and tetris <laughs> and come on bring it that'd be great um it's so funny that you said that because like this past weekend we had this little uh fun winter getaway with my husband's family and we went to this bowling alley and they had this full arcade of like pin everything from the 80s all the old pinball machines all the old like arcades you used to put quarters in and just go play pac-man and things like that um it was a riot so i, I i'm in for the arcade <laughs> yeah that's it's gonna have like uh, the uh, foosball, which is so much fun, oh, right? And ping pong and, and uh, you know, the driving games where it's like mm -hmm. the racing driving games where you're sitting side by side with in front of the screens. Yeah. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be a blast. So we wanted to, we wanted to do something where if you want to network with someone, if you want to try and do business with someone, yeah, you can go outside and look at the beautiful water and chat, or you can go to the arcade and you can play a game of ping pong and work out a deal. <laughs> Let's make it fun and have super great content at the same time. So if you're interested, go check it out. It's at the surge summit. Com. And yes. we have early bird pricing right now. And if you buy right now, uh, also you get a free ticket to the party. That's the first night. It's our tiki bar party uh, with food and drinks and all the things. So super, super excited. Yeah, you guys, this is going to be unlike anything you've experienced. This is going to be just so like, I'm all about education. Anybody that's in a business, anybody that's doing anything, whether, I mean, your teachers, your kids, teachers and professors, they have to go through continual education to be on the up and up about what's going on. So this, um, you know, I don't even promote a lot of events, but I really feel like this one is going to be one for all levels of all people where people can really, really learn some deeply rooted stuff that's going to help you grow your business. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, yeah, we want to go to the tiki bar or the arcade. That's the fun part, right? Neck, you know, networking. But at the same time, it's really important to take your education and your business very seriously because these are the things that are going to affect you in the future. Things are constantly changing in e-commerce. And these are, you know, let's you don't want to be the smartest person in the room so going here that's pretty much guaranteed so go there learn from people that are that, that have done that been there done this they've been doing it a long time they make 10 times more money than most of us do on amazon so we've always got a few things to learn there and so the surge summit.com you guys want to make sure you sign up for that if it's the only event you go to this year go to it first of all it's in tampa like it's florida it's nice it's on the water it's already you know our floridians right now are rolling their eyes they're like we want to go to the mountains <laughs> No, um, but for us Michiganders up here that I'm right now, I'm stuck in the snow. Um, yeah, it, it sounds wonderful to be able to go to Florida, Florida. So Leslie, thank you again for your time. You guys, I know you could be anywhere else listening to any other thing right now. I don't take that for granted. Thank you for listening to the Amazon Files podcast. Don't forget riverbendconsulting.com and thesurgesummit.com. And we'll see you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files. Thanks, everyone.